this is a message I have delivered to you before, and as I look back on when I delivered it, it seems like I was uh, moved to deliver this to you in the middle of the Hebrews. Uh, so we're leaving Hebrews for this Sunday. Um, because this should be a message I deliver to you at least once a year. Now, Dr. Scott had his 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. <laughs> they grew over the years, nitrophils. Um, this one, for me, I think I, I really do understand how much it is needed. I've told you the story of early on in the ministry, the people who had so wronged me and the successive waves of hurt that, you know, I could have been a stoic and not said a word, but I came to you some Sundays. I now am mature enough in my faith and mature enough in age to say I came to you some Sundays so very hurt that for the first 20 minutes I had to spend time almost verbally lashing out at those who were defiling the ministry or trying to bring its demise about. And it, it, it did things to me that as a believer, I now understand through the scriptures that is not the way to go, that as I began to pray and as I began to ask God, please help me because I cannot go on like this. I cannot survive like this. It's almost hypocritical that I'm, I'm out here saying these things to people and yet I'm grappling inside with how to move on because I have, I have now, I have poison in my soul. And I never, I could have never understood this had certain things not happened to me as they did. Now, some of you have been around the, these years. You know, you saw it. You saw the grief. There were so many things going on in my life. And I can only say thank God that the clarity from this message not only makes it possible to talk about forgiveness, but it will become an integral part if you are truly searching for peace with God. It will become an integral part of your life. It has for me and I return to it today. Now, the subject is forgiveness, and I'm going to hang this message on two scriptures. The two scriptures which are paramount will be the Great Commission in Matthew 28. You don't need to turn there because I'm going to just read these two scriptures to you, and then I will proceed with my message. But when Jesus says, Go ye therefore and teach, that is, make disciples, make learners, and by the way, the disciples, the learners, that's you, that's me, that's anyone who comes wanting to know. And then he says, teaching, that is instruction, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So this is not open to opinion. And then if the bookends are, it starts here, and then the end of that is in Ephesians 3, 17, where Paul says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And if, if the Great Commission is understood, and you are a learner, and you are being taught, and you are doing exactly what Jesus said because he tells his disciples, and then his sent ones, and then his chosen ones, to teach them to observe things, all things, whatsoever I have commanded you. And that can only be understood as Christ is in your heart. And how is Christ? Christ is formed in your heart by faith and stays there by faith. So the concept of this message is hinged there. It's not on a checklist of here is what makes you a Christian versus here is what not to do. I don't want people, because I've, every time I've delivered this message, I've had the sense that people have misconstrued the sense in which this is delivered. This is the most liberating message I have ever preached in all the time standing in front of you. Now, if, if you put through these two scriptures I've just given you together, you actually make a, a salve, and the salve is actually Jesus out of John's gospel saying, if you love me, if any man love me, he'll keep my words. So I'm asking you today to listen to his words. And I'm, I'm not actually asking you to keep them as a law. 
I'm asking you to do what I gleaned out of Corey Ten Boom. She said, we are not manufacturers of God's love or forgiveness. We are simply conduits. So in keeping his word, it means listen with an open heart to receive. And then while I'm giving you this background, I would like you to consider that over the last year, things have happened in your life. Yes, I have a pulse. <laughs> things have happened in your life. People have done things to you that you might just say, that just tops it all. Now, I, you know, every year that goes by, I think I've seen it all, and then there's just one more thing that I have not yet seen. <laughs> and the pain that comes with some of these things. Sometimes it's pain. Sometimes it's pain coupled with disappointment because you, you never thought in a million years that person, that person would do that to you. Am I speaking for anybody? That person. And usually, by the way, that person happens to be someone who is close to you maybe a loved one, a family member, it's that person. Or your best friend. Who would have thunk? All right. That's good English. But we need to return to this, as I said, once a year at least, because it is a well not only of refreshment for the soul, but it is a clear reminder that Jesus teaches this in such a way that, for me at least, my mind becomes crystal clear that in not proceeding with this, I do become hindered in my walk. I do become hindered in my communion with God. And I think, I don't really know why you would be wanting to hear and know about God if you didn't desire to draw closer. So it is an important message. Um, in the world's view, in the world's religions, there are different ways to approach forgiveness. For the Jews, if you're reading the Mishnah and the commentaries, it's seen as very simple. If someone has wronged you, you are to try three times to approach them, to uh, tell them, to convey, to communicate. Uh, and if, if they don't accept, receive, or acknowledge, then you've done your due diligence and you may move on. Which, I don't know, that's kind of, I, I don't really care for that one. Um, now, if you, if you go through the world's religions, it's quite fascinating to see what they, how they handle, how each religion handles forgiveness. Now, we're not speaking of being forgiven by God. We're speaking of that which happens on this uh, horizontal plane between creatures that we are. Now, uh, I've often mentioned these, so I'll just kind of briefly say, uh, if you look at Islam, for example, there's some interesting concepts of forgiveness there. Um, but nothing, you can say, well, there is a road map there because I have read in the Hadith and the Quran, but it is nothing like the road map given to us as clear instruction on what to do. Now, you may say, well, what's, the, what's your pick? Pick one. Well, I would have to say between the Eastern thoughts, either Buddhism or Hinduism, and probably Hinduism reaches its, its pinnacle as the closest concept in that, it is considered one of the six virtues within that uh, religious system, one of the six virtues that is looked upon as favorable and needed. So at least somewhere, somebody has an idea that this is important. It's a virtue there. But within Christianity, it becomes paramount. Now, many books have been written. If you uh, would go to a library, you could check out there are tons of books on forgiveness. I've told you, uh, PhD by the name of Fred Luskin, who uh, has a clinic at Stanford. It's all about forgiveness, but it's in the secular realm. And his work is very brilliant. I, I like it if it we're just talking in the secular dimension. Now, thank God that God has given us his word, and it's very, very clear. It's not ambiguous on the instruction guided, given, for us, because if we approached forgiveness on our own understanding, and I think many people do that. You know, have you ever have said this before? You ever said, I just, I don't, I don't feel, I don't feel that I can forgive you. I don't feel that it's possible. Well, let's just make it clear. Forgiveness is not a feeling. 
It's not an option. There are many ideas about what forgiveness is and what it isn't. So I'll, I'll go through the list. I have a, a list in front of me. But before I do that, I just want to say this. I have at least twice in delivering this message, I have heard people say, you know, I never thought of that that way. I never thought it was hindering me. I never thought that whatever it is I was holding on to was overtaking my being. So hopefully that will come to the forefront today as we get into the message. Now I have some quotes. Some of them I've read to you before and others I haven't. And there's one or two here that make me smile. Uh, it's the top of my list because I love it so. Oscar Wilde said, always forgive your enemies. Nothing annoys them as much. <laughs> I love that one. Forgiveness doesn't change the past, but it does change your future. That is true. Uh, anonymous. Robert Quillen said, a happy marriage is the union of two good forgivers. <laughs> as long as you don't forgive, I love this one too, as long as you don't forgive, who and whatever is it is will occupy a rent-free space in your mind. Isabel Holland, I love that. Because I don't want you living in here for free. You're using up this energy up here, right? Okay. A life well lived in peace with God and his word is your best revenge. That actually came out of my mouth. Yeah. And C.S. Lewis said, forgiveness is a lovely idea until you have something to forgive. And this one is quite profound, although I've read it before, it really it sunk, sunk in when I was reading it, and I reread it probably a dozen times. Thomas Merton said, we don't really know what it is to forgive until we have been forgiven. And I want you to reflect on that before I say anything else. Have you ever had a moment, and I'm, now I'm not speaking about your relationship with God, but just on a strictly horizontal level where something has happened, you are the one, you are the perpetrator, and somebody turns around and really wholeheartedly, innocently, childlike, plain, I forgive you, and it's truly forgiven. And when that has happened, there is a better understanding of what it means, not just for you, but for the other person, the clarity that comes. And we don't really know what it is to forgive, until we've been forgiven. Now multiply that with the understanding we have with God and you have arrived at the pinnacle of this message. Not yet. All right, so what forgiveness is not, I said it is not a feeling. And I lived there for quite some time. I didn't feel like forgiving some people because they were so mean, so nasty. I just couldn't bring myself to it. And yes, I spent, and I've told you this before, I would spend so much time lamenting to my immediate staff. And that's probably, you know, one of those things I tell you, don't run to the arm of the flesh. Well, I already talked to God, and God wasn't doing too much about it. So I figured, you know, misery loves company. Come on, spread the misery around, right? It's not an option. Like, I'm, I may just do that. You know, like, it's kind of like flashers, uh, blinkers on cars in California. They seem to be optional <laughs> if you drive. Some people just don't, they don't know that they're actually part of the car. It actually, <laughs> now you get it, right? Well, forgiveness is not optional. It's built into this mechanism right here. You know, you, you've heard people say, you must, you have to. Back it up with something. And don't back it up with just this uh, drive to say, I'm, I'm giving you an order. Back it up with something, which is what we're going to do. It doesn't mean forgetting. Forgiving does not mean forgetting. And as I get older, and as the events that I have subsequently let go of are behind me, I want to make this clear so that everybody will say, yes, this is a true statement. You never forget. Want me to say that? Especially the wives will tell you this. <laughs> wives never forget. Husbands, wives never forget. No, no. But human beings, we never forget. Our memory may fade a little bit going from those crystal clear moments 
to over time, it's, it becomes dulled and the details are not as poignant and not as sharp, but you never forget. And I don't want people to think, well, then that's not true forgiveness, because there's this erroneous idea, even in the dictionary, which I didn't, one of the dictionaries I had in my office. If you look up the word forgive, forgiveness, forgiven, and directly above it, the word just one jump up is forget. And so maybe somebody was looking in the dictionary when they thought, oh, they're pretty close. No, they're not. They're just close in the dictionary. That's all. So forgiveness is not being tolerant. Have you ever just tolerated somebody? They, have, they, they are repeat offenders, and you tolerate. That is not forgiveness. That just means that you're a sucker for more punishment. It's not, forgiveness is not uh, excuses or excuse making. I've, I've had people do something to me and they say, oh, well, I just thought that, you know, I just, no. Well, keep your thinking to yourself. It's not a sign of weakness to forgive. As many people say, oh, you know, if you forgive that person, they'll think you're weak. Well, we'll see, because it takes a, it takes a weakened vessel strengthened in Christ to do what Christ makes possible. Forgiveness does not make you the village doormat. You know, and I've done this before, too, where I've told people, you know, yeah, we, don't you read the Bible? It says, turn the other cheek. And I have two, but I only have two. So how many cheek events can you do? And at some point, um, you know, you may say, well, that's your interpretation. No, there is a clear concept being painted here. People like to take, hunt and peck these things and then randomly they, they make some application which has no application within the confines of the way Christ communicated it. Get it straight. And when that is clear, it suddenly it's like, well, no, wait a minute, that's out of context, which people are great at doing when it comes to these matters. Forgiveness is a process, and now the voice of experience kicks in. Because as I have, as I said, matured in the scriptures, I have recognized it is one, not a one-time event. I've had many people ask me. I've tried, I've been praying, I've been asking. Still nothing's happening. I don't feel like anything's happening. It's a process. And it's a process that can only be understood coupled with the scripture that says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That some new nature that has been placed in you will begin to flow through you. And that nature helps you along. As I said, you're not manufacturing. You're not going to say, well, I'm, I'm going to go out and forgive everybody today. No, good luck. <laughs> so, on that note, as I'm now telling you it's a process, I'm remiss that I didn't bring C.S. Lewis's uh, letters to Malcolm in there, chiefly on prayer. It says that he was praying and in his prayers, he noticed that suddenly after, this was a 30-year issue he had, he noticed that it had been lifted. It was no longer a burden. He had, it finally came to him. He had forgiven this person. And he asked the question, why didn't he do it earlier? It was that easy. 30 years of working this out. You know, if, if a giant like that had to labor and wrestle, trust me, none of us here are immune. Now, I don't think it's going to take 30 years because we have... I have taken the liberty to put together what I think is the clearest roadmap for anyone who is looking for, truly looking for, how to deal with this situation. And as I've said many times, you find what suits you, what your needs are in this book, and then you dig in, which is what I did. And back when I began digging in to find what I needed, which was I needed to know how God would help me lift this off my soul and continue my walk, which I'm telling you, it, it is one of those things that unless you have been there, you will not understand this as clearly. But what makes us become separated from God or draw back from God? Most of the time, it's all of the junk that comes between our communion. Now, you can say, well, is that like a, you're saying if I sin or if I... Well, we sin all the time. Lack of repentance, lack of prayer. These things can become a wedge. But also the things that we take in that become 
engrafted in us unless we are doing what exactly the scripture says. So please open your Bible to Matthew 6, which is the first place I take you. And my sole purpose today is to point out that what Christ instructs us to do is made possible. Matthew 6, and I'm going to be looking at verse 9 through 15, which is commonly called the Lord's Prayer, which is not the Lord's Prayer, as I've said now for weeks, but the disciples' prayer. And if I may, just, I, I just would like to entertain you with something. See, even the best, and this is a pretty good book. I've ha I have many of these in my library, Word Meanings in the New Testament, one volume edition by Ralph Earl, which is pretty much the gold standard for any preacher who has this in their, in their possession. But I always tell you, you know, even the best guys or girls or whoever can make mistakes or label things. And in here, you can look up words, word by word, and you can get a, a, a layman's definition of the Greek because this is of the New Testament. But here's what's funny is that uh, Ralph Earl goes on to describe a part of the disciples' prayer, and then he says, why do some congregations when reciting the Lord's Prayer? And I, I just closed the book, and I thought, okay, there's enough said right there. So for a scholar to, to still be calling this the Lord's Prayer, this is the disciples' prayer. And I just point that out to you. Jesus, they came to him, and they said, teach us to pray. And he said, when you pray, you pray this. This is your prayer. And the prayer, of course, that every, every person seems to know, even heathens know this prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And here we go from verses 12 through 15 in these short few verses here. Six times the word forgive will appear. You don't think that right there six times in just a few verses says Jesus is emphasizing something. More so than the daily bread, by the way, more so than many other things that are mentioned here. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, this is an interesting look, and we've done this before, so don't get bored on me, because I want you to really focus in on this. This is an interesting look. Six times the word for forgiveness is used, and there are, there are at least three Greek words we will look at. And this first one, I actually brought a dictionary out so I could read to you at least the short version. I won't read the whole dictionary to you. <laughs> but the word forgiveness, let's do this right now. The word forgiveness, this particular Greek word, So I'm giving you the short version. To let go or to leave, to leave or to set aside. It is also used for to leave behind. It may also mean to leave in peace or to let alone. But it is, it is to be understood as a putting to the side or a placing to the side, which can, by interpretation, we can simply say a setting forth or setting aside. That was the short version out of the dictionary. Whew. All right. So I want you to see that six times, and I think six is very important, by the way, because it's the number of a man or the number of man. And the other word that caught my attention in this, which is debts. And this word is quite interesting because we tend to think about forgive and forgiveness and forgive, but Jesus is talking about debts. And this idea somehow that we go through life and we are not accruing. We're already debtors. 
I don't think I'd have to convince anybody who comes into the church with the right understanding, you're already a debtor. You owe a debt you could never repay for what Christ did for you in that one act of going to die that day on the cross. You owe a debt. I owe a debt. Paul says we had a sentence of death upon us, but Christ, Christ forgave our debts. So there's something very powerful about this word that as I begin to look, it, it gave me this kind of, um, well, I am a debtor already, and I owe a debt I can never pay. But then it's juxtaposed with this word forgive, to put aside, to release. And I think we'll never understand, we'll never even become to the point of beginning to understand why this is nestled in the disciples' prayer. And I want you to think about this. This is why this could not be the Lord's prayer, because the Lord did not need forgiveness, and the Lord was not a debtor. So let's just make that clear. But what is so amazing about these two words, forgive and debt, is they're going to be carried through other pictures in the Bible. Now, same book, Matthew 18. Turn there. And here we are. Matthew 18, verse 21, and this is here for a reason. I love the fact that there is not one word in this book that is just randomly there because, because. It's a purpose. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And seven times. Now we have that same root word, forgive, seven times. Remember in the Jewish frame, which Peter would have been familiar with, Three times sufficed, and then you've done your due diligence and you have nothing more to do. So seven times, perhaps there is, you know, many people have speculated, I think that that number seven always represents com completion. So maybe in Peter's mind it was like saying, if I do it seven times, I'd be like, that's enough. And I love what Jesus says. I say not unto thee until seven, seven times, but until 70 times seven. There's a whole lot of forgiveness there. And, you know, I love what David Duplessis pointed out. He said, that may mean 490 times a day for some people. Think about that. That's staggering. That means you'd spend literally almost every, what, 10 seconds? <laughs> Never mind. Just, I don't even want to think of where you would be doing the forgiving acts if that occurred that often. But the point is that when Jesus begins to talk now, I love that the opening of this in verse 23, he says, therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto, attached to the concept of what Peter has just asked him. A certain king which would take account of his servants, and when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed, and there's, that's your same debt word out of Matthew 6 that we were just looking at, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, his wife, children, all that he had, and payment to be made. And the servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all, pay it all back. We've all, I think, had moments they may not resemble this quite, but where you've, you know, in a moment of desperation, you'll, 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 you'll say anything, you'll do anything, it'll be blah, 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 right? We've all done that. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him. There's our other Greek word we'll talk about in a minute. And forgave him the debt. So we have these two words now side by side, the loosed and forgave and the debt. There it appears again. But the same servant went out, found one of his fellow servants which owed him, there's your debt word again, a hundred pence. He laid hands on him, took him by the throat, saying, pay me, pay me now what you owe me. His fellow servant fell down at his feet beside him, saying, have patience with me, I'll pay thee. Isn't that the same thing that he said? This is the exact same thing, but he would not. But went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. There's your word again. So when his fellow servant saw that what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done, 
Then his Lord, after he'd called him, said unto him, Thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. You asked me to. And your debt was gargantuan. Does anybody know what our national debt is? Okay, I don't know. Can you count that high? I don't think so. None of us can. His was like the national debt, and this guy here was like maybe somebody's a week's salary. But he wouldn't forgive him. Shouldest not thou have also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I've had on you? His Lord was wroth, delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due. There's your debt word again unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Now, go back to the background. It's Peter that asked the question. It's Peter that came to him, his disciple that asked the question. We're, talking, we're not talking about a random discourse here. We're talking about Peter's the one who asked the question that brought this out of Jesus' mouth. Now, a few concepts here that in reinvestigating this scripture, of course, we've already looked at that one word that we saw in Matthew 6, which is to set aside. And I've read the dictionary on that word, but the other word, loosed, and he loosed him, apaluete, is a compound word that I should have pointed this out a long time ago. Apo, luo, luo, to loosen, to let go of. In some dictionaries translated as setting a prisoner free, completely releasing. So we have two Greek words giving us a picture. Now don't, don't be quick here and say, yeah, you know what, I, I've got this message nailed down because I'm going to show you something that as I begin to mull through this again, it dawned on me that as Jesus responds to Peter's question, elsewhere in Luke's gospel, there is the comparison in fact. So turn with me to Luke's gospel, because I want to drive home a point today which I think is um, very clear. In Luke's gospel, the seventh chapter, and we're going to be in Luke's gospel in chapters before and after, but turn to the seventh chapter. And we're familiar with this uh, story of the woman, beginning in verse 36, who comes, she's called a sinner, and she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. She stood at his feet behind him, began to wash his feet with her tears. You know all this story pretty well. She kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he, if he were a prophet, he would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him. For she's a sinner. Now, listen to Jesus carefully. And this is juxtaposed against what we just read in Matthew. Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. Saith, Master, say on. And you have the same words occurring again. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. That's your same word for debt reoccurring. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. There is your depiction of what we just saw in a microcosm in Matthew's gospel. And when they had nothing to pay, which is both of these men, previously mentioned, by the way, he frankly forgave them both. Now, the story breaks down here and it's not the same. He says, tell me, therefore, which of them will love, will love him most? Simon answered and says, I suppose he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, thou hast rightly judged. Now he turned to the woman and he said to Simon, you see this woman, by the, from the time I've entered into your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she's washed my feet with tears, wiped them with the hairs of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman, since I've come through your, your house and sat here, she has not ceased to kiss my feet my head with oil, you didn't anoint it, but this woman, she anointed my feet. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. There is that other same first word we looked at in the Greek, that is to set aside, but in, in this case they are removed. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he saith unto her, thy sins are forgiven. Now, I find it interesting 
because we can always take these two pictures and almost mesh them together. This is our nature. This is who we are as creatures. So quick that when, when, when it's pointed out to us how black our nature is, how dark and how contaminated and how sinful we are, when we come to that understanding, we, we may begin to beg and to plead, not, not that we need to because we don't need to, that the act that he did at Calvary suffices, but we, we may, as creatures, we may begin to beg and plead, Lord, have mercy on me because I'm so sinful. And then as time goes by, we... We feel, we know, we've understood, we've read, we've studied. I'm forgiven. I'm set free. Jesus, Jesus loves me. This I know. The Bible tells me so. He loves me. He loves me. He loves me. But then we, as we begin to walk, we go back to this vignette, if you will. And again, it always happens this way. You'll always find that it's the smallest acts that are the most difficult to, to forgive. And I'm reminded of this, that if we are reminded of how great, how great is our salvation, of how great a Savior we serve, then we should also recognize that the things that happen, this horizontal plane of existing, will always have incidences, disappointments, people who will injure us, we will injure others. We may not even mean to along the way, inadvertent things that happen. But forgiveness will be part of the trip. And that's why I love the fact that you cannot escape. It's, it's clearly put here. And then Jesus even takes it a step further because we'd say, well, the Pharisee, you know, he's a, he's a religious guy, right? He should get all this. But it was the woman who was considered so disdainful. And don't you know what type of woman this is that you're letting her touch you? And she's the one that gets it because she's the one coming in, not with the mouth, but with the actions and his declaration sets a clear tone. Now, only God can forgive our sins. I know there's a lot of confusion when people talk about forgiveness. Only God can forgive us and cleanse us. But what he tells his disciples in the prayer we've just read out of Matthew 6, he says, when you pray, you pray this, which means it's something that we are unable to do. We are enabled we are made capable of, not on our own, not in the flesh, but we are made able to. Now, before I go on to say one other thing out of Luke's gospel, if you want to flip back to chapter 6, because there we'll look at the famous martini scripture, as I call it. Every single fundraising baboon on Christian television... There, I said it. You happy? <laughs> Which, by the way, I can say it, but it makes a mockery. It makes a mockery out of our faith when, when I see people doing the antics as they do. It makes a mockery out of what we should be preaching. Jesus said, go into the world and make disciples out of the things that I've told you, not these other things, which must come from Satan, I'm sure. All right, I've just eliminated... Uh, Lots of potential people, which I don't want as friends anyway. Love your enemies, brothers and sisters. Love them so well. All right. So, Luke 6. Oh, my goodness. Yes, yes. That's what I said. <laughs> Luke, see, this is real for me. It's not just something I'm telling you all. You know, you ought to try this. This is real for me. When I read this scripture, Luke 6, beginning at verse 37, Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Okay, I, I, I was just guilty of that. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, there's your word, apuluete, and here it is as a, an imperative. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. And then, of course, here, you know, here come the evangelists. They only want to quote the uh, 38. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, oh, boy. <laughs> and running over, quick, get another container to hold the blessings that are coming down right now. Sorry, wrong channel. <laughs> but they never preach that verse 37. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Forgive, completely let it go, and you shall be forgiven. Now, somebody might go, wow, are you saying, are you suggesting 
that my activities and interfacing with other people affects my relationship with God? Yes, I just said it. Now, I didn't say it. Christ said it, recorded by two different voices, Matthew and Luke. Now, that's, that's kind of jarring. Now, this does not mean you, as I said, doesn't mean you go out and you try and find a way. It means that you read these scriptures and you understand that what, what Jesus says, he also makes possible. Remember, I preached a message on follow me, I will make you fishers of men. Follow me, I will make you something you are not right now. You will become this. And they didn't become this in the time that Jesus walked even after he was resurrected, they became this later by the Spirit taking up residence and abiding with them, and that's how it was made possible. The day of Pentecost was not that Peter was eloquent and somehow he was a great orator, because we know during the life, the earthly life of Christ's ministry, Peter was a blabbermouth, foot in, insert foot in mouth and scratch head. Not a good speaker except for one utterance when he said, Thou art the Christ, they had to go and ruin that too. So, what I love about this are the instructions given. Now, there's actually more, but these are the ones that are the clearest. There are three phases to forgiveness. The fact that we are hurt, we hate, and we heal. And in the hurting process, which I camped out there for a long time, in the hurting process. It's not always clear that you need to reach into the scriptures. Remember what I, I, I said on festival maybe two weeks ago? Put the brakes on and go find the promise. Go find the word that applies to your situation right then and there. Now, I'm giving myself the preaching that I should have preached to myself a couple of years back. I would have saved myself a lot of grief. But in the process of hurting, I also want you to see if you're looking towards God and you're not introvertedly, uh, you know, why is this happening to me and how did this happen, but you're looking to God, the hurts of the past will become tools for the future. The hurts of the past are not designed to break you down and make you uh, this just this random piece of broken clay on the ground, but rather they are designed to build you up in Christ. Now, it took me a long time to get this straight in my mind. Not everything that comes into my life is going to be building me up for the edification and building me up for the body of Christ and making me, but every single thing that comes into my life, God can use to help shape me and take me from the hurting place to the healing place, and you don't get there like that. I know there's people that would like to tell you how quickly something happens, but I said it's a process. And sometimes people take years. C.S. Lewis, it took him 30 years. For me, it took me the better part of, I want to say, two years to get around to understanding, not cognitive, I read this, but deep penetrating into my soul to understand these words were given to make sure that my communion remains steady with him, not poison, not bitterness, not anger, not wrath, which brings me to my last Greek word out of Ephesians 4 and verse 32. So if you'll turn there, please. And I think God was extremely gracious to put this in my pathway, give me the comprehension, the ability to understand how needful this is. Paul, in closing up the fourth chapter, we'll call it, beginning at verse 31, that all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving. Not the same word as the other two words. This is a different Greek word. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So now we have this word at the root of forgiving, being translated forgiving here as karizomenoi, 
which is at its root the word for grace. So we get a clear picture of what this looks like, the letting go or the setting aside, the completely releasing, and the fact that it is also viewed or seen as a grace of God. Now, I think no illustration has stayed with you so clearly as the one I use regarding how we, we, we tend to do this. Now, I just gave you the message, which also means you don't only have the road map, you have the capacity to pray and ask God for more help, more clarity, more focus on these points, if this is what you're dealing with, and eventually we all will, and it's repeated, it's not a one-time thing because people are constantly hurting us. But no illustration could be clearer than this, although I've just given you all the instructions. You will say, I'm ready. I'm ready to begin this process. And it starts with, really it is, it's, it's, it's all the poison, it's all the junk, it's all the garbage you've been carrying. It starts by literally taking it all, and I've done this before, you take it all, and it's in my trash bag. Now, I've, I've analyzed all the stuff I've got, and I just... You know, I put it down to the curb, and I know what day is garbage day, so I know the critters aren't going to attack it, but I'm going to leave it there, and I'm going to, I'm going to go back inside now because I feel like I finally have amassed and collected my thoughts in a very cohesive way, and it's all in that bag right out there at the curb, which represents what I might do taking my problems and my issues to Christ at the foot of the cross, and I make no, it's not meant as a blasphemy to say there's no comparison, but give you the picture here, the pictorial sense, but then I'm, I'm now here and I'm starting to think, wow, I've got really nothing to think about because I, the things that I was thinking about, they're over there. And you know what? I got to go back out here and I got this, you know, I just then you start, you know, you start going through the trash and oh boy, and you know, wow, oh boy, oh, there, there, that one. You know. <sighs> and no way we go back in the house because that one, I just can't let go of that because what else am I going to talk about? Because this is the thing that's plagued me for an entire six months and I just can't possibly let go of it, right? Well, I, and I have been so, I've, I did this. I was my own trash picker. Because, and that's why I said it's a process. Don't think, oh, I'm, this is, I can do this now. I'm going to take it all now, and I'm, I'm taking it out. I'm going to, you know. Yeah. Because, think about it. What has consumed your thoughts regarding a person or event, an event? And then suddenly there's, this, there's a vacancy in your mind. What was consumed by is now there's a vacancy. What am I going to think of? Wow, I have this free space here. Oh, boy, I got, I got room for more. Come on, come on. I gotta get some more stuff out of here. Now I feel better. I feel I feel like I feel safe. Because there's this danger, I think, psychologically for us of letting go of certain things. But this is why Paul says, you are to let all, let it all. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, be put away from you. Now, if that's the visual you need, great. I've told you the other thing that I used to do which I don't do anymore because I found another nifty way of doing it, but I used to. I used to sit and write the names of people on a piece of paper, and then I'd crumple it up, and I'd rip it up, and I'd go over to the trash, and I'd throw it in the trash, and I'd say, there, that's where you belong. And then I would go back to studying and praying, and I'd say, Lord, I just put those people in the garbage. If you want to go save them, that's fine, but... But I don't do that anymore. Because now that everybody is so worried about conserving paper, I just, what I do is I put, I put them on my computer now. Because on your computer, you can, ha you can ha still have that crumpling sound. You know the crumpling sound when you hit trash? And then you can still empty the, tr see the good thing on the computer is you can actually empty the trash and it has that emptying sound and then it's gone. So I can't go back and get it again. It's my new invention. See, the computer is handy for some things. But you have to take this information. And it's not something 
that you, you may say it's not something that I need to implement right away, but it's something that if you have been burdened down, and I called it a poison of the soul, you need this message. Now, I love the writing of Koi Ten Boom, and I love what she described as she was approached by a young woman who was a new convert, forgiven of a lot of riotous living, I guess, but she came to her at one of her talks and she said, um, I'm worried about how to actually deal with the situations of my life. I've read from the book to you before and that she was afraid she might actually, as she put it, fall back into sin. It's kind of an antiquated uh, book, but it doesn't matter. The idea is that old-timey thing. I may fall back into something. And it's there that Corrie ten Boom talks about how in Holland the church, every church has in its uh, foyer area the bell that's rung by the sexton. There's a, a cord and the sexton comes and rings the bell and as long as the cord is being tugged on, the bell will ring. And she likened it to if you and I will quit tugging on that which keeps sounding the bell, which keeps reminding us, which keeps bringing back the noise, but rather let go, quit tugging on that same issue, let it go once and for all, give it to Christ, and you'll see that the noise and the clamor and the racket of everything that you have been contending with in your mind, which has been, become a poison to the soul, the noise begins to subside, the bell begins to slow down, and with each, there's less momentum, less momentum until finally it stops. And that's what it's like as a process for us in the concept of forgiveness. At some point, if you'll quit, quit tugging on those things and quit reaching back for them and let them go, it will stop, it will subside. Now, your enemies, they may not subside. You know, people talk, well, you, see, you, well, you have a lot of enemies out there. Well, anytime you're going to take a stand for what's right, anytime you're going to take a stand for Christ, people will come against you. And that, there's lots of history to back that up, and, uh, apostles and uh, church history that has tons of volumes written on the subject. And all I'm going to say to you is, do exactly what Christ said. When he said, now you understand why you need your enemies. Because we're told to bless our enemies, those people who keep wronging us. Don't expect them to come to you. And don't expect that you'll ever walk up to somebody and say, oh, you know, I, I'm sorry. Will you accept my apology? If, it, if that happens, great. But don't expect your enemies to come and say, you know, I've come to my senses, and I've really treated you badly, and I'm sorry. Don't expect it. If that's your idea of uh, forgiveness, you will be miserable for the rest of your life. You are doing it for your communion with God, for your soundness, for your peace, for your wholeness with God, not for the other person. The other person may benefit if God touches them and they wake up and they repent and they're sorry for what they did, but don't expect it. But your enemies, you actually need them. Hello. Because it was my enemies that brought me to this place. It was my enemies that made me press into God's word. It was my enemies and their cruelty that made me realize the answer is here. The answer is not in how am I going to handle this, but rather the instructions that Jesus has clearly said, and the Apostle Paul picks up, it is a laying aside, it is a complete release, and it is a grace. And if I understand that grace is unmerited favor, the same unmerited favor that I walk in as a believer, I'm extending to when Paul says, for Christ's sake, that same grace is being extended. Now, I cannot tell you, and I've said this before, how liberating this message is been for me, but it's needful. And as the end of the year comes and people will begin to start making their New Year's resolutions of what they're going to stop doing or what they promise they think next year will bring and they commit to things that will last maybe about a couple of days, this is something that you can start looking at not as a New Year's resolution, but as something that will aid you, that will help you along the way. Because I do know this, there are enough things that come into our life that hinder. Satan's very crafty, by the way. He always brings things that will distract. And this behavior is not, you know, the Mishnah says, by the way, that 
Forgiveness is, is easy or comes naturally to Israel. No, 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 no. Forgiveness made possible the way Christ says is made possible through his spirit in us as conduits, as the natural man is not capable. You may say, well, well I've met people who are not in the church who are capable of forgiving. Well, you may be right. But the way Christ lines it up and the way he puts it so clearly, it becomes clear to me that I'm not doing this for some self-serving reason that it's all about me. It's about my relationship with him. And in that, in that case, you may say, well, that still is self-serving. No, it's, it's my service to him that matters and my fellowship with him that matters. So when people talk about forgiveness, you may say, I'm not quite there, it's a process, and God is working on me, and God is giving me the directions to be able to abide in this word and move forward. But guess what? At some point, you're going to do what I did, and you're going to do what C.S. Lewis did. You're going to wake up one morning, and whatever it is that was in your soul and in your spirit, you're going to wake up one morning, and you're going to say, you know, I didn't even think about this for the last week. And then you're going to be angry that you remembered, that you started thinking about it because for a whole week you didn't think about it. But the reality is that's the process of the healing that begins to occur. And as time goes on, as you keep revisiting these, you will really see with great clarity that the message to the believer when Christ came and appeared to his disciples was peace. That first message in appearing to them was peace is the foundation nestled in here, that you cannot have peace with God while you're busy fighting with the forces around you, and you cannot have peace with God and communion with God while your mind is separated on how much hate is there and how much you want to take vengeance. Well, the scripture says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You let God do the justice uh, department, because he's way better than any bureaucrat could ever do. He's the department of justice in God's economy, and he'll work it out for you. You Stick to the roadmap he's given, and the roadmap, at least in this way, is quite clear. You're not doing it for the person who's wronged you. You're doing it for Christ's sake. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call one 800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.